So it warrants a conversation in light of effective public speaking, just sort of um, what not to do with regard to persuasive speech. Um, <clears throat> when we're looking at persuading an audience, it's important to note that there are ethical factors at play. So ethics includes a lot of different things, but mostly as we discussed with regard to ethics poll, it's gray area or <clears throat> points where it isn't particularly wrong, but it's not necessarily right in a, in a similar way. So when you think of persuasive speech more so than argument, there are factors of ethics at play. Why is it? Well, one of the words that is commonly cited is the word coercion. It's a type of persuasion where a person's thoughts, an audience member's thoughts and behaviors are altered. And in some cases, it's because they were strong armed or they were bullied into it or they made a decision based upon false information or false promises. Maybe fear was leveraged. And so if you are thinking ethically and you're really trying to engage an audience with your effective abilities you don't want to again strong arm them into a position that supports yours um i'd like to cite a couple of instances um <clears throat> how you can avoid coercion um you do that by avoiding um emotional appeal to the point that it becomes a fallacy um and we'll talk about the fallacies in a second. The other thing is to stick very closely to logic. Logic is, for the most part, um, foolproof, and that's why it's important to logos and even ethos as a speaker. Um, so to avoid that, um, we will be talking briefly again about fallacies, and some are more common than others. Um, so in public, in the, in the persuasive speaking arena, a lot of times you have the bandwagon fallacy or the begging the question type of fallacy. Um, these are based upon faulty assumptions. So everyone takes out a loan to buy a car, so you should too. Um, appealing to the majority to make them feel bad <clears throat> because people have that crowd mind or crowd, crowd tendency, crowd thinking. Or begging the question, Lion King's an excellent film because it has excellent animation. Or marijuana is good for you because it's natural. Again, it's stating facts that aren't really, it's, it's making an assumption about your product or your position without really giving them the facts first. You're already declaring that this is acceptable. You're already declaring that this is good, but you've given them no reason to believe that that's the case. That's based upon an assumption, and that is what a lot of public speakers do. Um, other fallacies that try are those that try to attack the character of a different person or organization in order to make yours look better. You don't want to do that. Um, there are, th these are some interesting ones, the fallacies of case presentation. So the non sequitur, I don't plan to vote today because I'm moving next week. Or you should clean your room because I'm going to do the laundry. It's like, um, that doesn't really have anything to do with what it is that you're trying to say. So persuasive speech, let's say you're talking to your parents and you're trying to get them to do something and you say like, I should go to that event, that, um, that movie, that concert or whatever, because last summer you guys got to X, Y, or Z. Well, that's a completely different argument. They are adults. You are not. They're in a different generation, different situation, different circumstance, different concert. So <clears throat> that's non sequitur. It's like it, it does not compute. The red herring, I shouldn't be fined for parking in a red zone when there's so many people out there committing real crimes like robbery and murder. Or war is wrong, but in times of crisis, we should support the president. Again, what you're doing is you're trying to redirect the audience to think about something else, and you're pointing out a completely unrelated example in order to garner support for your position. Um, next is an appeal to misplaced authority. Oh, this diet is the best one for people with my health condition. Oprah <laughs> says so. That's the example given here. Um, you don't want to do that. Um, fallacies of suggestion the either or fallacy either you're with us or against us that's kind of the all or nothing thinking is another way to classify the either or thinking um 
Please be aware of these because in persuasive speech, people try to use every tool in the toolbox, but not all tools are ethical. Only logos and ethos to an extent um, and pathos as well to within reason. Yes. Okay, we're back. So organizing persuasive messages how to do that. Um, because some of you are like, okay, I know I want to make a persuasive speech, but how? Based upon what we talked about before with regard to audiences, I think I may have closed. No, I still have it up. Um, if you want to look back here, it gives you a kind of a cheat sheet for how to organize things if you have different audiences. But <clears throat> there are some other kind of generalized sequences that have been suggested. So one that is very common with public speaking is called the Monroe's Motivated Sequence. Um, with this, there are five different steps. You have the attention step first, get the audience's attention, describe your goals, and preview the speech. That's pretty clear. It's like the, the context and thesis statement at the same time at the beginning of what you're going to say. Next, you move to the need step. You provide a description of the problem and the consequences that may result if the problem goes unresolved. In this step, alert the audience members to their role in the issue. Here's a problem, guys, and this is how we can solve it. I'm here to provide you that opportunity. Three is the satisfaction step. <clears throat> you outline your solutions to the problem, and you show that you have full understanding, capability, and that you are able to um, <clears throat> articulate. I'm being yelled at from my child. It's okay. And then step four is the visualization step. Audience members are asked to visualize what will happen if you do implement this. Just imagine, just picture. Let me tell you a story about. That's the visualization. And then lastly is the action appeal. Based on everything I've just told you, if you want this to be your reality, take a step today. And obviously we make light of this as like the typical sales pitch but you're going to get some practice at it. So um, that'll be next week, but I just wanted to kind of preview that you will be working on the Monroe's motivated sequence for next week. So look forward to that. Um, if you don't prefer that sort of roundabout sales pitchy manner, then the direct method is a way of organizing your speech in which you just directly state, this is my claim and um, this is why I'm making this argument point blank. So it's more like the Tuleman model of argument because it's a lot more direct and logic based. The casual pattern is sort of more of a problem solution speech. Um, <clears throat> it describes a general cause and a specific effect and then the person's role in that conversation or speech. Um, lastly is the refutation pattern. Um, in this case, the refutation pattern can be engaged when you're trying to persuade an audience that your position is better than theirs. How do you do that? Well, there's four steps. One, you want to signal the argument um, that you're responding to very specifically. Say, like, this is the person that I'm rebutting and this is why. This is exactly what they say. Line it up. This is similar to our rebuttal. Then what you do is you state your own argument. You provide justification and evidence for your side of the argument and then you summarize your response. Um, so those are the four steps for the refutation pattern. And so that kind of concludes an, the overview of what I'm trying to help you accomplish through um, persuasive speech. Uh, that's it for this week. Next week we're going to be talking more about strategies and specifics for your own persuasive speech that you'll be putting together with regard to context, with regard to the um, the audience that you have specifically and how you intend to proposition, like create, craft your propositions, um, which of the rhetorical appeals you plan to utilize, and then what your method will be of delivering that particular speech. So we'll get into all of those um, more application-based details next week. So go ahead and review this entire article if there, there are pieces that you feel like you're still unclear on because you will be um, accountable for those next, next time. So that is it for this conversation.